In Jesus, you are fully known and fully forgiven and fully loved. This is why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Well, good morning, everybody. Have you guys gotten your ballots yet? You showed up in the mail? We haven't checked our mail yet, so I didn't know. I know we were, we were expecting them yesterday. Let me encourage you to vote, to do your civic duty and vote. Um, I think it's an important thing that Christians should participate in who governs us. Government has a, this is not the main message this morning, okay? But government has a very specific purpose biblically, and that's to protect the citizens. Um, to protect us from evil, to stand up against evil. And so I think um, if you're wondering how to vote, who to vote, let me encourage you to look, certainly look at the character of candidates at every level. But beyond that, look at the platforms that they represent um, and not just the fancy words that they use in those platforms, but actually the actions that stand behind the platforms. Um, and keep in mind that no matter who ends up in the White House, the Senate, the Congress, the local city council, that Jesus is still on the throne. Amen? Yeah. I'm a little nervous this morning. <laughs> that or maybe it's too much coffee. Um, well, moving from one somewhat uncomfortable topic to another, let's open our Bibles together to Luke 16. Luke chapter 16. Uh, Pastor Travis will be, he's up at the men's retreat teaching this weekend. That's why you're blessed to have me this morning and, and I'm blessed to be here actually. Um, we'll be back in Exodus next week. But this morning we're going to look at a parable, actually a couple of parables in Luke chapter 16. While you're turning there, and I can hear the pages feathering, that's always a good sound. Um, while you're finding your way there, I want you to know a little, a little something about the layout of Luke. Um, from chapter 9, verse 51, all the way through chapter 19, this is often called the, uh, the Luke's journey or the, um, the term is not coming to me at the moment, uh, well, the travel narrative, okay? So in other words, everything that takes place from 951 all the way up through 19 are things that Jesus says and or does knowing that he's headed to Jerusalem, knowing that he's headed to the cross, knowing that he's headed to his death, burial, and resurrection. So that's kind of the larger context of the passage we're going to be in this morning. And then drilling down a little bit further into the context around our verses, there's actually three parables here that, that, um, to go together, maybe more than that actually. This whole section is parables in the, in the book of Luke. But, uh, but three in particular this morning that um, they go together. At least, well, at the very least two parables and possibly an actual event. The one that we're going to spend most of our time on, um, there's a possibility it's uh, an actual event that Jesus is speaking of. All three of them, though, deal... A, uh, or have as one of their topics wealth or finances. It starts in chapter 15 in a, a parable that you're probably quite familiar with, the, the parable of the prodigal son, which would probably be more aptly named the parable of the lost son or actually the lost two sons, right? Neither son does well in that story. Um, and then that's followed by, in, in uh, 16.1, the parable of the shrewd manager, which is one of the most challenging parables to interpret. We're going to look at it briefly this morning. I'm not going to try to interpret all of it, but we will look at it. And then finally, the parable, or perhaps this could actually be a story, the story of Lazarus and the, and the rich man, um, which is one of the most challenging parables to receive because it requires self-examination and, and it makes us uncomfortable to read stories like the one that we'll look at this morning. Now the first parable, the younger brother, the younger brother squanders his, his inheritance. In other words, he squanders his dad's money. 
In the second parable, the shrewd manager actually squanders his, his master's money. So he squanders someone else's money also. And then in, in our main story this morning, the, um, the rich man squanders his own wealth, his own inheritance, uh, his own finances. So we're all familiar with certain stories. We all grew up with fairy tales, right? Think, um, well, we all grew up with, with a character in distress and then either the hero or the heroine coming in and saving the day, right? And what always happens at the ends of those stories? And they lived happily ever after, yes. There are expected characters and expected outcomes in these narratives that we're aware of and actually that much of our, probably a lot of our worldview is actually built around, whether we know it or not. Um, Think Cinderella, for all of you probably over 50. Think Frozen, for those of you who are younger, who have kids. These are, these are redemptive stories in a sense, right? I mean, not the same redemptive kind of story as the Bible, but they are redemptive stories within our culture. Um, again, you've got the heroine or the hero coming and rescuing in these cases, in both these cases, the damsel in distress or the damsel who's come under some kind of bad influence in the case of Frozen, right? Um, well, there's another story that's a few decades old probably. I think most of you will recognize it though. And it's... Uh, In this story, it's about um, a green ogre and his talking donkey. Somebody recognized it right off. That's who I thought he was going to go to. (laughs) Um, So this green ogre, and uh, and then also in the story, of course, is a beautiful princess. So we've got the, the beauty and the beast in a sense, right? And the beautiful princess, her secret is actually that at night she becomes a green ogre, uh, unbeknownst to Shrek, the the uh, one of the primary characters in the story, right? But as the story progresses, and as we come to the climax of the story, they actually do kiss. And in, but instead of being, there's a plot twist here, right? And instead of being transformed permanently into this beautiful princess, she's actually transformed into the green ogre. And they live happily. Exactly. You guys have seen the story. <laughs> uh, the best of my memory, it really is a cute movie. There may be some parts in it that are inappropriate. I'm not sure. So don't recommend it, but it is cute. Um, but it's got that same idea, right? Damsel in distress, hero comes along, rescues her, and they live happily ever after. Now the difference in this one is the plot twist, right? Of Instead of becoming the prince and the princess, it's actually the ogres, right? But it's still a great story. It's very touching, very heartwarming. Um, but that, that outcome comes unexpectedly. It's not, it doesn't fit the general narrative of our hero, heroine kinds of stories. Um, so the third parable that we're going to look at, it's actually similar, similar in nature to this. It was a very, just to give you a little bit of background, it was a very common plot line in the day and age of Jesus. Um, this, this story isn't um, exclusive to the Bible. It's not exclusive to Jesus' teaching. There were Egyptian stories very much like it. There were, there were um, histories of Mesopotamian heroes and heroines that lived out this same um, plot line. The, a rich person who set up as, the, as um, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the foil in the story. And... But there's a plot twist within this story that, that we'll point out as well as we go through it. Um, we have our own in our culture. You guys will recognize this. I think all of you, dependent, uh, no matter what age you are, uh, Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. You guys have all seen it, right? Yeah, it, it has the same kind of plot line. And that will come through as we go through here. But it, you've got uh, same kind of characters. You've got a poor family, sick child. So Lazarus, the character of Lazarus built into them. And then you've got Ebenezer Scrooge, of course, who is um, the greedy rich man, right? We've got the threat of death here. And then we've got uh, warnings of the afterlife, right? People coming back from the dead, essentially, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And this is where we'll see the plot twist in the storyline today. Um, So to our story. You are in Luke 16. Let's actually start in verse 1 there and uh, read 
a ways through here. We'll read uh, verses 1 through 13 to begin with. Now, like I said, I'm not gonna, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this parable, but I do want to point out a couple things that, that lead toward the story we will be in. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a, who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am too ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from manage- management, excuse me, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down and quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Now, that's the part that's really hard to interpret in this. But consider this, that the manager, no character in this story represents God. Uh, What the person did in being shrewd is actually what our world does. It's what our typical worldview is in business, in how we interact with people. And frankly, our culture commends that kind of action, does it not? Being shrewd and, and, you know, sucking the last dime out of everything possible. Um, That's that's essentially the uh, sin of greed in our culture. Um, Find where I left off here. So verse 8 again. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. That's actually a good thing. That's saying that you and I, as sons of light, don't act like this. Or that we certainly shouldn't. We shouldn't be shrewd in our interactions. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. So that when it fails they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. This is the part that's really challenging to understand. Um, Moving on to verse 10. One who is faithful in a very little, this part I think explains it. One who's faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, in other words, if you can't deal with the wealth that you have here and now in this culture, how can God, uh, how can he bless you and expect that you're going to do better with things like eternal blessings, eternal wealth, right, which is the blessing of being in his presence forever? Um, that's what he explains here. He says, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who's going to entrust you to the true riches? And those true rich- riches are actually the blessing of the kingdom. It has nothing to do with money. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Remember the, um, is it the ten minas, the parable of the ten minas, when, when uh, whatever this man is, has will be taken from him and given to the person who had ten because he managed it well? Um, so same kind of idea here. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now take note, it doesn't say it's really hard and it takes a lot of effort. It says you cannot serve both. You cannot have two masters. You can't serve mammon and God. Uh, Verses 14 through 18 are about authority and we will read through them. Um, But before we get there, because the the verses about divorce just seem to be like thrown in here randomly. And they're really not. Um, But this section is about authority. It's claiming that Jesus is a source of authority in terms of revealing the way to God, which is a major theme throughout this journey section or the, the, um, uh, yeah, the journey narrative that Luke lays out from 951 through, through chapter 19. Talking about Jesus's authoritative pronouncement. Um, including prohibiting divorce, but that's actually an illustration of his authority. 
And it goes beyond the exception of Moses in its description of the perils of remarriage. It shows that righteousness actually hates divorce. It hates the way two parties treat each other in that process. Um, and serves as a reminder that Jesus is the authoritative messenger, messenger of God's kingdom. God's values mean that we do not serve money, verses 10 through 13, or worship ourselves, 14 and 15. But we are, are we're urged into, excuse me, we're urged to enter into the kingdom, verses 16 and 17, and to have values that honor commitments to God and to others, and that's verse 18. So let's read through there, and then uh, we'll enter into the main passage for the day. Verse 14 of chapter 16. The Pharisees, and this also sets the context, sorry, um, this also sets the context of the people that he's speaking to, the Pharisees, and why he's speaking to them about wealth, because they're actually lovers of money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. Said, we can serve both, <laughs> essentially. Verse 15, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God, that shrewdness. Is an abomination, that not living, up to, not living up to commitments, not having his character. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, right? But not not that it would go away. He's reiterating that in this passage or speaking of the same kind of idea. And, and what, is the, what, is the, what is the law? I mean, Jesus said you could wrap the law up in two statements essentially, right? He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? To love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, everything about you. And then the second is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? Essentially, that wraps up the law. Um, if we could do that, there would be no need for Ten Commandments. If we loved God with everything about us, and we loved our neighbors ourself, that would fulfill all of the commandments. Thankfully, because we can't, thankfully Jesus came and did it for us, right? Um, and then verse 18, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. And again, this is at least a part of this is just Jesus claiming authority over the law and bringing to mind these commitments both to each other and commitments that we make before God. Um, verse 19, let's enter into, actually we're going to read the whole passage and then we'll work our way through these verses. Verse 19, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades... Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let him hear them, let them hear them. And he said, but no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they, can be, neither will they be convinced if someone comes back from the dead. 
Notice immediately the contrast between these two men as we work our way back through the passages. Um, the first section is all about this contrast. It's a narrative about the contrast between the two of them. In fact, the, I titled the message Contrasting Lives or Lives That Contrast. Um, and you'll see that in the first few verses. And then there's, a, then there's a, uh, an actual dialogue that happens. So it's really two sections uh, made up of three parts in a sense. It's, it's um, the rich man and Lazarus in this life, the rich man and Lazarus in the next life, and the permanence of their situations. Um, so let's work our way back through looking at each of these passages. And, and I know it's a, probably a fairly familiar passage if you spend much time in the Word um, but not one that gets taught all that often. So verse 19, it said, there's a rich man who's clothed in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. It sounds like a pretty simple sentence, doesn't it? But it's important to understand uh, some of the nuances that are happening here. This guy is like the cream of the crop. He's the rich among the rich. He's the top one-tenth or one-one-hundredth of a percent of the richest one percent. To be dressed in purple regularly, uh, purple was a very expensive color. There were only a couple of sources for the dye, and one of them was snails. It was very time-consuming and very expensive to make purple clothing. Um, and then secondarily, purple was uh, uh, represented royalty. So essentially, this guy is parading around all the time wearing royal clothing, presenting himself as a, as a king, essentially. Uh, and also just flaunting his wealth through his clothes. Beyond that, the, the fine linen, the word that's used there for fine linen, it, it, it uh, typically refers to undergarments. So I know we don't usually talk about underwear in church, but that's exactly what this is referring to. And it's talking about the finest linen from Egypt, the most comfortable. So imagine if you've got like, I don't know, what, 1,200 thread sheets or 1,600 thread sheets maybe on your bed at home and how comfy they are com compared to... You know, the last motel you stayed at that had the scratchy, the scratchy sheets or the scratchy towels, right? Um, that kind of difference. So, so from, from the very inside of his clo clothing to the very outside representing him, everything is just as fine as it can possibly be in this man's wardrobe. And then it says that he feasts fump, uh, fumptuously. No, actually, he feasted sumptuously every day. Uh, not just holidays, not just Thanksgiving, not just Christmas, right? But every day he had a banquet. Now, this, this did not happen. It doesn't happen in our day and age very typically. Um, but again, this is the contrast that Jesus is setting up in this story. We've got this person who's just absolutely the top of the heap, right? And he's, he's presenting him that way. Um, to the point, if you weren't aware of this, they didn't have like paper napkins like we do, right? They would use uh, bread to either to sop up soup out off of a bowl or, or plate, and, but then also to wipe their face with a piece of bread and then just throw it on the ground um, as scraps to feed the dogs, as we'll read here in a moment. Um, so he's feasting sumptuously every day. He is just extravagant in everything, wealthy beyond wealth. This also shows up in the next verse when we meet Lazarus. Um, where it says that Lazarus is placed at the gate. This actually is indicating that this person lives in a mansion that's walled off, separated by an extravagant... The, the word here is like it's a, it's a, an, a serious gate, an extravagant type of gate, um, delineating again that, that it's a mansion inside where this man lives and walls himself off from the likes of Lazarus, this poor beggar at his gate. And verse 20 says, And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, the idea that he's laid at the gate gives us, uh, indicates to us that the man, he's not even strong enough to walk anywhere. He's not strong enough to go to the normal area where beggars would uh, seek alms from passers-by. Uh, and there was this idea that the rich in the, in the town should take care of um, those less fortunate than them, than them. And one of the ways that this happened is other people would carry them and place them at the gate where these people living in, in such accommodations would, would um, need to go past them and take notice and, and give them help. 
of some sort, right? Uh, it'd be nothing for somebody with this kind of, of opulent wealth to send his own servants out to take care of Lazarus, to take him scraps, um, to clean up his sores. But not even that happens. And you might get the idea that, um, uh, that the dog, well, the covered in sores shows us that he's unhealthy, right? And then the, this desire for scraps, that he's unfed, and then the dog's coming and licking his sores. You might get the idea that this is a mercy that's happening to him. It's really not. Um, the dogs in those days were fit into two categories. They weren't pets. They didn't have labradoodles. They didn't have, you know, snickerdoodles, nice pets that, that were really... Oh, that's a cookie, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they didn't have nice animals. They, were, they, were one, they fit one of two categories. Either they were wild, so think dingo or hyena type of an animal... Um, that might be looking at Lazarus as lunch. And then secondarily, they would be guard dogs, which is probably the case in this story. It's probably the rich man's guard dogs. And those dogs are coming and licking his sores, um, which isn't necessarily bringing healing. Dogs' mouths are not particularly clean. And secondarily, it's also making him, at the very least, making him ceremonially unclean. So he's unhealthy. Well, even before that, he's uncared for to a large degree. He's unhealthy, he's unfed, and he's unclean. This man has no hope, save one. His name, Lazarus, is actually a shortened uh, form of Eleazar, which in the Old Testament is, you see Eleazar multiple times, and Eleazar as a name means helped by God, the one helped by God or helped of God. Which, when you look at the story, I mean, personally, if I'm looking at the story and I'm thinking, that's the guy that's helped by God? I'm not sure I want to be that person at this point in the story, right? I think I really want to be more, more like the rich guy. Um, he seems to have it all together. But Lazarus is actually the one who is helped by God. Notice also that he's the, at this point at least, he's the only one that's named in the story. And that does a couple of things for us. One, it indicates that he's actually the, the most important character in the story, not the rich man. Lazarus is the most important character here. Um, so, uh, and his destiny, where he ends up, you see that, you come to see that he actually is the one who's helped by God. Um, at this point in the narrative, the great equalizer appears, which is death. It's a great equalizer that's coming for each and every one of us, in case you're wondering. 100%, 100% of the time, 100% of us ends up returning to the dust from whence we came. Um, so it is a great equalizer in our lives. Verse 22, it says, The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Pretty simple statements. Not a lot of pomp and circumstance here for either one of them. Um, and we don't want to read too much into this, but notice that nothing is said about Lazarus' burial, just that he died. Now, chances are pretty good in that culture that as a poor person, he would have been carried off to a common grave and just tossed in and, and buried along with all the other unnamed, uncared for um, poor people in the community. Uh, but notice what happens after. He's carried away by the angels. And he's carried away to this place called the Abraham's side, Abraham's bosom, paradise. When Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, this is a representation of that place. Um, it's a representation of heaven. In Jewish eschatology, it was Jewish ideas of end times. This is the place they wanted to go, Abraham's side. Um, so for them, it was exactly the same concept that we would think of as the eternal state of heaven. Um, so again, we don't want to read too much into it. Uh, but also notice that up to this point, I've just said that. He's the only character named. So the rich man is never named in the story. Again, giving Lazarus the prominent role um, and drawing attention to him. Um, up to this point, the story is going just as everyone would have expected. Everybody who is familiar with this, again, I, I mentioned earlier that this, this plot line 
was very familiar to them. Um, and up to this point, the story is going exactly as they would have expected. They're, you know, even the Pharisees, they're kind of nodding along, going, yeah, yeah, that's how the story goes, yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, verse 23. I'm looking at my notes and pausing. I'd be terrible on radio with more than two seconds, three second pauses, right? But I got ahead of myself, which tends to happen for me. So, uh, verse 23. It says, And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Speaking of the rich man who... Um, it says was buried. The other idea around this that we can kind of assume is that being a rich man, he would have had a very uh, elegant burial, probably a parade in the town, and and all of the town's um, leaders would have spoken up and said what a great person he was and how much he helped the town and, you know, just just singing his praises. Uh, And then he wakes up in hell, essentially in torment, it says. And we see here the contrast of the two, guys, two men. And this is where that contrast ends and the dialogue begins. Um, now, what would you expect the rich man to be saying at this point? I mean, he wakes up in hell. You might expect him to see Lazarus in paradise, far off, being comforted. And I don't know, the first thing that might come to mind is, oh, Lazarus, I, I, I blew it. I'm sorry. How could I have treated you so poorly? That doesn't happen at all. There isn't any sign of remorse. There isn't any sign of repentance. In fact, you can tell that his heart really doesn't change because he cries out to Father Abraham, which is actually him playing the race and covenant card. Race as in, hey, I'm one of your children, Father Abraham. I belong to the chosen people and I belong to the covenant. So he's, he's pleading to Abraham as his father, but he's still treating Lazarus like a dog. He's still treating Lazarus like a servant. He, said, he says, Abraham, send this servant to take care of me because I'm in torment here. I just, I need, if he can just, just a drop of water on my tongue because of the torment I'm experiencing. Um, a couple of things at this point out to us. Again, he doesn't seek forgiveness. Um, He overlooked Lazarus in life. He continues to overlook Lazarus in death, which also points to the idea that he was fully aware of who Lazarus was. He knew his name. The rich man knew his name. He would have presumably recognized that this is the poor beggar that that, uh, sat at my gate daily. And now he's in paradise and I'm in Hades in torment. But instead of changing his focus, instead of having a heart change, he continues to focus on himself. And he continues to to treat Lazarus as if he's an untouchable. Um, Again, he cries out to Father Abraham, and this is so ironic, he's nothing, or he was nothing like Abraham in life. Abraham was kind. You can read about Abraham's life in Genesis. He was kind. He was hospitable. He greeted people when they came to his tent. He fed them, uh, which was a really good thing since they ended up being uh, angels and the servant, uh, servant of the Lord or angel of the Lord, right? Um, there's not really a definite indicator that he knew that. But even beyond that, later in life, he continued to treat people with honor and respect, uh, tithing to, uh, to the, the high priest of Jerusalem, um, you know, the priest in the order of Melchizedek, mysterious guy. Um, And then even in returning, you know, the things that uh, were taken from the other kings, from his neighbors, essentially, in the story about Lot. Uh, Again, if you're not familiar with these, Genesis is a great read. Um, So he cared for, fed strangers, and um, dealt with integrity. All of his actions, now I say all, I'll qualify that and say younger in his life, there were some issues about how he treated his wife and, and uh, claimed that she was his sister. And if you're familiar with those stories, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but later in life, his integrity really grew and, and the way that he interacted with God and presented as um, this father of the Jewish nation was really uh, a good example in many ways. Um, so verse 24, he calls out, the rich man that is, calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue. For I am in anguish 
in this flame. It's interesting, he doesn't, even, he doesn't ask Lazarus to do it. He doesn't ask him himself. But rather he appeals again to the boss man, to Abraham, to send Lazarus, who he continues to look at as a servant. Even in hell, the rich man can't see his guilt of his own self-importance. In verse 25, but Abraham said, child, and I'm sure this is a bit ironic, son, perhaps, as if you were my son, um, you know, by blood for sure, but certainly not in service or action. Uh, nevertheless, he says, son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Now, we oftentimes want to probably extract a little more about the ideas of hell from these verses than we should. Um, it certainly seems to point toward flame and anguish and, and misery. And I would caution to not um, necessarily be very dogmatic about how literal that picture is. At the very least, though, we know it's, it's a terrible place to be, and it's torturous. And the Old Testament often talk, oftentimes talks about this thirst as a desire for God. And at the very least, hell is a separation, if not from the very presence of God, at the very least, a separation from His goodness. Uh, and so there's this expression of thirst and desire and, and really need. And, and it's probably as much mental anguish as it is uh, physical anguish. Um, <clears throat> the one thing we can draw especially from the last couple of verses here where it talks about no one can pass from us to you and no one can pass from you to us because of this great chasm. It indicates that hell's a very permanent place. Uh, it kind of does away with the ideas of purgatory or going to some temporary place that you can be prayed out of, depend, you know, dependent on other people, seeking, uh, uh, seeking uh, righteousness for you. Um, it just doesn't seem that that's possible. No one can go from paradise to Hades, and likewise, no one can go from Hades to paradise. Verse 27, and he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, notice the furthering reversal going on here. Who's the beggar now? The rich man is now begging Abraham. His, his focus has shifted a bit. At least he's focused on his brothers at this point and not on himself. Um, and he has real concern for his brothers who are apparently just like he is. And he knows that. Also take notice that he never questions why he's where he is. There seems to be an inherent knowledge of his own um, lack, but it's there's still no repentance in that. Only discomfort and the anguish that he's in. Um, and then in verse 29, but Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And here's where the plot line twists. Because up to this point, the story has gone along exactly as everyone would have expected. As the story was told in various cultures and in various ways, Somebody from the dead would come back and bring warning, just like the Christmas carol that I mentioned earlier, um, where the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future came and warned Ebenezer. And you see this changed heart, right? And a man who, it, in his case, is still alive. But it's the same idea. It's the same kind of uh, storyline, same kind of narrative. So even the character, even the rich man seems in the story seems a little bit confused at this plot twist. He's going, but no, he's correcting Abraham's theology, saying, but no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they're, they're going to repent. What are you talking about? You're messing the story up here. You know, get back in line. Get back on track. And he said to them, if they do not hear, this is Abraham, or uh, yeah, Abraham speaking again. He said to them, him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, 
Neither will they conv be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. They have everything they need, essentially, he's saying, in what they would have called their Bible in that day, the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament. They can listen to Moses and the prophets. Listen to, my, listen to God's word that's written down for them. That's sufficient. If they don't listen to the entirety of the Old Testament, which is all pointing towards the coming king, it's all pointing towards the one who changes lives, the Passover lamb, the one who changes hearts, then they're not going to listen to somebody coming back from the dead. They have everything they need. It is rather ironic that in, that in John 11, another Lazarus is actually raised from the dead. And they believed him and everybody rejoiced, right? No. What did they want to do to Lazarus? They wanted to kill him. They plotted to kill him at the same time as they were plotting to kill Jesus. So Jesus brings somebody back from the dead and they didn't believe Listen, Luke knew where the story was headed, and the greater irony that's being placed here is that Jesus himself also came back from the dead, fulfilling the Old Testament. And what's more, we have the eyewitness accounts in the Gospels, in the Epistles, in Revelation, the entirety of Scripture, right? How much greater is our burden? How much greater is our responsibility um, to believe than theirs was? Romans tells us that mankind is without excuse just because of the creation. People know just because of the creation that God exists. How much more without excuse are we due to the resurrection and the revelation of who Jesus is? Not only to believe, but also to proclaim. Romans 10, verses 12 through 15 uh, Speaking of death as this great equalizer, but so is Jesus. Uh, in verse 12, he says, but there is no distinction. This is how Jesus equalized things, right? There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then he presents the problem. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How beautiful are my feet? I wonder at times. How beautiful are your feet? It's a good question to ask yourself from time to time. We need uh, to take inventory of our hearts, which is reflected actually in our actions. Uh, the theologian and author David Garland sums up the, this entire parable with this sentence. He says, wealth is not a bar barometer of one standing before God. It is both a source of peril and obligation. Using it wrongly and ignoring the welfare of the unfortunate will bring divine judgment. And I'd offer as a reference for that, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. It's the separation of the, of the uh, sheep and from the goats when Jesus said, you fed me and you gave me water when I was thirsty and you visited me in jail. And they're like, when did we do that? And he says, when you did it for the least of one of these, you did it for me. And then as he sends the goats away, he, he, uh, you know, he, he pronounces judgment on them because they didn't feed him. They didn't bring him water. They didn't clothe him. They didn't look after him when he was in jail. And they're like, when did we see you in jail? When did we see you hungry and thirsty? And he said, when you didn't do it for one of the least of these, my brothers, you didn't do it for me. Um, so just encourage you to read that. Friend, you may not think of yourself as rich, but if you have loose change laying around your house or in your car, or if you're not particularly concerned about where your next meal is going to come from, um, you're very likely in the upper 20% of the wealthy in the world. Um, the majority of the people in the world today live on less than $7 a day, and that's an average, uh, less than $7 a day. And over 700 million people live on less than $2 a day. And I don't share these kinds of statistics with you to make you sad or to make you feel guilty because you should feel neither, really. Maybe some sadness of the injustice in our world, but, but you really should. I'm not doing this to bring guilt, Okay. Um, but rather just 
to bring perspective, maybe to, maybe to change our perspective a little bit about, about our own plight or the own problems that lie before us. I don't necessarily think it's our job to end world hunger or our job to end poverty. As a small rural community in southern Oregon, we don't have the means or the access to do either one of those things. But what we do have is the means and access to make a difference in someone's life that the Lord puts within our sphere of influence. The person who's laying at our gate, the needy person that we see. Now, I'm not talking about every panhandler that you see on the street in downtown Medford, right? I mean, there's a lot of people that are doing things out of their own choices. Um, perhaps some of them that are making more money than any one of us, right? Um, so I'm not necessarily talking about those things, but people that the Lord puts into your sphere of influence, and in particularly those who you know by name, and you know that they're hurting, you know that they have need. And oftentimes we offer prayer for them and little else, which is an amazing thing to offer. But we also need to offer support uh, financially, friendship-wise, time-wise, energy-wise, uh, to be involved Listen, I want a quick story and, uh, and then just a few more points here. Um, this story is uh, from a, some friends of mine who went on a short-term trip to a country in South, uh, South Asia, Southern Asia. As they're interacting with people, they went there to share the, the Jesus film. Uh, so they're traveling from village to village, showing the film, ran into some persecution and some really some combativeness in a few places. And, and other places, they were welcomed with open arms. And but this one place they happened to go, there was a, a, a woman there um, that they were made aware of and saw, and she is, she's, on her, she's on her deathbed. She's similar to Lazarus in the fact that she doesn't have the strength to get up and to go anywhere. She can't feed herself. She's just, I mean, she's at the point or near the point of death. And um, the person from, who's actually from our body who uh, is there, he's interacting with the, 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 the indigenous people that he's serving alongside, right? I'm, I'm struggling not to say names or countries, um, <laughs> but I don't want to do that and expose anybody. Um, and he's interacting with these guys and, and he's saying, listen, we need to help this lady. And they're going, listen, dude, we cannot help everybody who's got a health issue in our country. There's, there's million, there's millions of them. And he's like, I know, but the Lord has put this woman in front of us and we can help her. And the good news is that they did and they got her some medical help. And I don't know if, I don't remember if we ever heard the outcome of that. But nonetheless, they demonstrated Christ's love for this woman just in interacting with her, helping her, and showing that, you know, it's like we're not, we didn't come here to solve your country's problems, but we certainly can, can change this lady's life by helping her um, and, bear, and bear witness of Jesus and his love at the same time. Um, the locals there, they were so used to seeing poor people on the street that they just didn't even see this lady. It was just like Lazarus laying at the gate of the rich man. And they're Christians, you know, so it can happen to us as well. Um, Who's God put at your doorstep? Who's God put at our doorstep as a church in Southern Oregon? People dealing with unplanned pregnancies? Uh, people that we can reach out to through ministries like the Pregnancy Center or the Youth 71 Fives ministry to uh, teen, uh, teen moms throughout the Rogue Valley, uh, primarily teen moms that are still in school? Uh, these are two, well, it's one great organization with multiple outreaches, or U715 is one organization with multiple outreaches into our community, um, really touching many of the most hurting and lost in our community, as, long as, as well as the Pregnancy Center. Um, Medford Gospel Mission. Uh, these are organizations that we support financially. They also could use your time and energy, if you're able, and certainly can use your prayers. Uh, Perhaps becoming other ways to be involved, other people that perhaps the Lord is putting at our doorsteps, especially as a church. Uh, maybe you can become a foster parent. Maybe adoptive parents. You know, one of the big dings on the pro-life community is that we don't want to see people make choices that end a baby's life. But then once they're born, oftentimes we're a little less involved. Um, so we, could, we certainly could do better in that area, right, of, of involvement. Is this getting uncomfortable yet? 
it's an uncomfortable passage. It's uncomfortable realities, right? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to guilt anybody into doing something. Uh, seek the Lord, pray, and if there are places in any of these ideas you can be involved in, hey, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Um, do it, I and mean, do it wholeheartedly. Um, mentors, they can use mentors in all of these places too, especially those who have chosen life for their kids. They don't have the skills or the resources a lot of times to take care of them well, and even just coming alongside of them and, and being an encouragement uh, can be huge. You may not have the financial resources, um, but maybe in your retirement years you have the time. Maybe you have the energy if you're younger <laughs> to contribute. And certainly we can all pray, both locally and globally. These are ways that all of us can contribute. Friend, I want you to take note that God does not condemn the rich man in the story because of his wealth. He condemns him because of his hard heart, because he's not compassionate to care for those around him. Likewise, Lazarus is not righteous because he's poor. He's not righteous because he's poor. His heart is right, and he's cared for by God. It comes down to their heart for both of them, not what they do, but actually who they are and what change has happened within them. So whose life is influenced? The question, whose life between the two of them is influenced by the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbors yourself. Clearly, it's Lazarus. There are uh, at least three primary points that we can draw out of this passage. The first one is that God will hold us accountable for our heart posture because our actions display actually what our heart posture is. It's not the other way around. Having good actions doesn't lead us to a good heart. Having a good heart that's been changed and softened by God actually leads us to good actions. We put the changes that he's making in us um, into service, into action. And we see that in the parable. The rich man lived in grotesque luxury all the, t- all the while being aware of Lazarus' situation. He even knew his name. Um, and it wasn't some great societal issue, you know, the man laying at his gate. It was someone close to him, someone who he knew. And consider what Lazarus had to offer here. Little to nothing, Right? It's within his name. He's the one who's helped by God. He just believed and trusted. Uh, The second point is that once we pass out of this life, our eternity, our destiny is sealed. There's no repentance in hell. There's no time for repentance there. Um, There's no second chance. The rich man's heart remained hard, and he was exactly where his decisions led him to be, exactly where he chose to be. The third point, while there's still time, confirm in your own heart your decisions. Do an inventory. Examine the areas of hardness that you have. Where is there compassion lacking in your life? Um, and then when you go to help, maybe, maybe the lack of compassion, being, a, being a, a very conservative group, I would have guessed for the most part, um, oftentimes our lack of compassion right now may be uh, geared towards immigrants. And legal or illegal, I, I, there's a difference, right? Um, but legal, uh, legal or illegal immigrants, if they're the person that the Lord puts on our doorstep, they deserve our compassion. Um, our immigration system is broken, okay? It needs to be fixed. But that shouldn't affect how we interact with people. We don't need to be checking their green card or checking whatever to, to see if we're going to help them or not um, in an individual basis. Uh, And I said three, but actually we might as well throw in a fourth here too. Proclaim the good news of the gospel to your friends, to your family, and to those who are within your sphere of influence. Point people towards the scripture. Declare your own personal testimony, how God's changed you, how he's changed your life. Because once you're gone, or once they're gone, the opportunity is also gone. On a very practical note... Before we will have, we'll finish with a song so you guys can head on up, Jer, if, if uh, you're here somewhere. <laughs> Where are they? They've abandoned me. All right. Acapello, I guess. Whew, that'll be dangerous. There they are. <laughs> Thank the Lord. <laughs> oh. Hey, <laughs> on a very practical note, a very 
uh, a very practical need that I was made aware of this morning. I got a, I got a text from a family um, that has multiple young children and young children with autism, uh, and they need to move. They need to move tomorrow. If that's something that you might be available to help with, it's, it's from Shady Cove to Medford, so it's not a terribly long move. Um, but but uh, the, the grandmother in the family made me aware of, a, of a, a need. So if that's something you might be able to help with, come see me right after service and let me know. I'll give you more details, contact information. Um, and then also, of course, consider picking up a shoebox and uh, get involved in that ministry, pack together some gifts for kids and, and have a, an eternal impact um, on lives that may not necessarily be all that close to us, but you actually will know their names. They, you can, uh, they'll provide feedback back to you. So let's pray. In fact, let's stand together and pray. And remember that uh, after the service, there will be folks up here to pray with you. If you've, uh, perhaps you've made a decision to follow the Lord this morning, um, or perhaps something in the message has touched you and you need prayer. So, Father, we're thankful for your love and goodness. We're thankful for really an a hard, challenging, uncomfortable story, Lord, that um, makes us reflect on our own lives, makes us reflect on our own hearts, what we're doing with, um, with the provision that you've given to us, Lord. Uh, so, Father, I pray, I pray for myself and all of my brothers and sisters that are here uh, and those listening on the Internet, perhaps, or, or hearing these words later. Father, that you would do a work in us. Uh, give us a compassion for those around us, Lord, a compassion uh, for the lost and needy. And, and those lost and needy, they may be wealthy or they may be dirt poor, Lord, but they need you. So help us to have compassion for that. Help us to have compassion for those experiencing injustice or um, just poverty, Lord, abstract poverty, and, and actually to, to give them a hand up, not a hand out, but a hand up, uh, actually helping them to thrive in life, to give them community, a, a sense of purpose and belonging and destiny, um, because of the hope you've given us, we can show them that destiny, Lord. Show them what they could have waiting for their future if they just trust in you. Uh, so, Father, we are grateful for these things and lift uh, them to you in Jesus' name. Amen.